Tonight I would like to discuss something that really should take up our lives 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And I think that behind the message really lays the solution to almost anything that's important to a human being. As a rabbi, and before I came here tonight, I went through my emails once again on a quick search just to make sure it's precise. I would say about 90% of the questions that we get are not uh, halakha, complicated halakha questions, I wish they were, and not uh, intense gemara battles, or battles of faith for that matter either. But rather, normally the questions range what, between, bless this one, that he should get better, bless that one, that he should be rich, and the other one, he should find a job, and this one needs to pass a test, and the fourth needs shalom bayit, and so on and so forth. So I did a little study in my 500 recent emails that were requests, not informational things, 462 of them were requesting blessings. And all of that in less than two days. So, obviously, there are many people out there that are looking for many good things to happen to them very quickly. And they have a munat chachamim, they turn to rabbis and pray for us, and with that faith, Am Yisrael survived all the years. But interestingly enough, Possibly there are things that we can do in our day-to-day -day life, things that we can focus on that, not a rabbi, but God himself who promises that we will merit the success in all the important things to us. And tonight I'd like to spend some time to discuss them. There is a Gemara. The Gemara is in Masechet Shabbat, Kuf Yudchet Amud Aleph. The Gemara talks about three major incidents or situations that everybody wants to avoid or to be saved from in a good way in their life. The three biggest things are Milchemet Gogu Magog, the war that we hope already happened, as many rabbis believe during the Holocaust. Um, but if not, that may happen later on, before Mashiach comes, the final war, where the nations of the world gang up with their ultimate goal to gang up against Jerusalem. Those of you who are strong enough to follow the news, know that the United Nations recently decided to give a comical ruling saying that Hebron, Marat HaMachpelah, and Kever Rachel is Palestinian historic sites. They don't belong to the Jews. And now they want us to lease them from terrorists. That's part of Milchemet Gogu Magog. That they're ganging up and fighting all the nations of the world to fight the Jews and our holy sites, including our sites in Jerusalem. Another thing that obviously if we do things like Lui Nishmat, that just stresses that even more. One of the things that we keep in mind and in our hearts is we want that when we come upstairs to heaven and we face God after 120, we should have a clean slate and we should go straight to Gan Eden because nobody wants the alternative. That's another thing that everybody's concerned about and tries to protect himself from. The Gemara talks about an additional thing that kind of blends with Gogu Magog and that's Chevlo Shel Mashiach Gogu Magog is just a war and then there's Chevlo Shel Mashiach which is the entire environment of everything that's going to go on both in Israel and with Jews abroad right before, in the final stages before Mashiach comes which is also days that everybody wants a protection from to the point that it's brought down in the Gemara that Amoraim said that they don't want to be alive in the days the Mashiach will come because the problems will be so great that it's going to be hard to withstand such, tra such tragic and stressful moments. So obviously if we have an insurance policy that we can buy that guarantees us protection from these three major incidents that everybody wants to stay away from in their life, that's a pretty good investment. Now for those who don't plan the future that well, but live the day to day, that's for sure that everybody in this room wants health, wealth and successful children. Not only that, we always want our kids to be better than us. I think the standard speech that every uneducated father or mother gives their child is you must go to college no matter what. Look at my mistake. I, if only I would have been smart when I was younger and went and gotten a PhD in something or the other, today my life would have looked different. Meaning even though we don't have something, as parents we love our kids and we want to see their best and we purely mean it, we have no other motive or intention, and we always want our kids to grow to be better than us. Chinuch yiladim, educating children, is most probably the toughest task of today. 
especially that our kids are more advanced than us in almost everything. When I have any obstacle along the way with technology, I turn to my 11-year-old daughter. She normally knows them better than I do. Which means that our offsprings, our future generation, is growing up in a new era that even us that are just 10 or 20 years or 30 years older than them don't understand what this era is. We don't even relate to the way they live 100% addicted to technology. You know, it's, it's just 20 years ago it wasn't that way. And to be able to overcome all the obstacles that modern technology brings with it, including the great te tests, Nisio note, that our kids have to go through, is a very, we need a very big merit for that. And we need a very good strategy to protect our children from all harm. And if there's an insurance policy for that, if somebody comes to you and says, I'll sell you a policy, the premium is really cheap, doesn't cost money, just a little effort, and you're guaranteed to have successful children, anybody in the world will jump on that. And for those who are still young and don't have kids yet, or think that their kids are perfect and therefore they don't need this, definitely money and health are two things that everybody wants to acquire in life. The wiser ones amongst us want health than money, others want money than health. But one way or the other, we definitely want them both. So, recently, I was looking into marketing strategies, because I was going on a launching a campaign that tonight you're going to be part of. And I wanted to see which products marketed the quickest and the best. And it's interesting, in the medical world, for example, which is an area that I'm more familiar with, one of the pills that sold best was a vitamin. A vitamin that has very limited research on, and I don't even know how approved it is or isn't, but it was called the Wonder Vitamin, the Wonder Pill. It pretty much solved all your problems at once. That's the way they advertised it on television. You're losing your hair, take the Wonder Pill. You have a headache, take the Wonder Pill. You have this problem. Every problem you got, anything you want, just take the Wonder Pill. Even though a lot of, officially, the things that it benefits many times contradicts each other medically, but who cares? We advertise. Nobody knows better anyway. And suddenly the phones are ringing nonstop, and people are becoming rich overnight. Agents, pyramids, many Jewish people rode that wave as long as it lasted. Everybody wanted that wonder pill. Everybody wanted to solve all their problems by taking one pill. Tonight I got a spiritual wonder pill that I think is going, doesn't take much effort, just a little focus and a commitment. I, not I think, it's been proven to work 100% of the time because God says it works. And the Gemara says this, Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi, Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Mishum Bar Kapara. This is a list of rabbis that said in the name of each other, going back to Bar Kapara. Kol ha-mekayem shalosh seudot b'shavat, nitzol mishalosh pur'anuyot. Anybody who's mekayem, who keeps, who sticks to, eating three seudot, three meals every Shabbat, is going to be saved from three tragedies. Michevlo shel Mashiach, Midina shel Gehenom, Umi Milchemet Gog Magog. The first three that we mentioned. That person is guaranteed by God Himself that just for eating, and we like eating, right? So it's not that hard. Just for eating three meals on Shabbat, he will be saved and he's going to come to heaven and he won't have to go to Gano which means he'll have a clean slate that's a pretty good deal and the Gemara proves it from Pesukim but we won't be matriach the tzibur to go into the proofs if you'd like, look it up Gemara and Shabbat as we said Kuf Yudchet Amun Aleph but this goes further and if we look good in the words of the Mishnah Brura the Chafetz Chaim in Mishnah Bura brings down, he adds, on, he adds on to this. And he says this, that if somebody is going, the Chafetz Chaim is in Siman Reish Nun Vav, Sif Katan Bet, and he says if somebody is going to make it a point to invest in keeping Shabbat properly and doing what it takes to honor and respect the Shabbat the way he should, he's guaranteed 100% to have Banim Talmidei Chachamim that are Gdolei Yisrael. He's going to have children that are going to be Torah scholars, successful kids, and not just regular Talmidei Chachamim. Gdolei Yisrael. Imagine you come to somebody and you tell him, we have a formula that guarantees that your child is going to be like Chachamavad Yosef. 
any sane person, religious or not, is going to jump on the opportunity. And I've tested this all over. And people say, of course I want that. Sometimes people that they themselves are not even observant. A son as great as Chalvadi Yosef, what could be greater than that? Chafetz Chaim writes, you want a formula that's going to guarantee that your children are going to come out great? Make sure to observe and respect Shabbat properly, which soon we'll discuss what that means. The Gemara continues and says many other things along this line, and I just want to bring a few of these examples to whet our appetite to hear how to go about this and how to succeed in this new mission. The Gemara, one page later in Shabbat, Kukyu Tet Amud Aleph, the Gemara talks about this. Wealth. Ashirim. I have a friend who did a search in all the Gemara. Every time it says Ashir, he wanted to know everything that the Gemara talks about rich people. So this was one of the things that came up in his search. Rabbi asked Rabbi Ishmael Bar Abiyosi a question. What was his question? Ashirim Shebe'eret Yisrael Bamehen Zochim the wealthy individuals in Israel, in what merit did they become wealthy? Amale, so he answered them, Bishvil Shemeasrin, because they give Maaser charity, Shinehemar, Aser Taaser, Aser Bishvil Shitit Asher. Point one. Point two, the Gemara continues. Shebe Babel, the ones that live in Babylon, Bamehen Zochin, why did they merit to become wealthy? The Gemara says, Amarle, he answered him, Bishvil Shemechadim et HaTorah, because they respect the Torah. They have a special respect for Torah, that's why they merited to become rich. Vishibishad Aratzot Bimahim Zochim, those wealthy individuals who live in Staten Island, how, how did they get rich? Shad Aratzot, the other places in the world. Comes the Gemara and writes, Amarle, he answered him, Bishvil Shemechadim et HaShavat Because they respect Shavat And in that merit, Borei Olam grants them the gift of wealth So here we got it, clearly in the Gemara, not hints, not Gimatriot, not Kabbalah that we don't understand Black and white in the Gemara, guarantee Shebeshat Aratzot, the wealthy people all over in the other lands, in the other cities, and suburbs, and countries Everywhere, with what do we merit to become rich? Because we respect properly et Shabbat. Namar Abichia Bar Abba. Abichia Bar Abba said a story. Pa'amachat, one time, I went to a Balabai, a business person. I was his guest for Shabbat in a city called Lutkia. And they brought in front of him, in front of this Balabait, Shulchan Shel Zav, a golden table, Masoi Shisha Asar Bnei Adam, it takes 16 people to carry it, that was the weight of gold, today's gold prices, that's a lot of money. V'shesh Yisrael Shal Shalaot Shal Kesef, Kvotbo, and 16 chains of silver ornaments decorating it. V'ka'arot, v'kosot, v'kitoniot, v'sluchiot, all the china, all the dishes, k'vot bo'alav, that were on it. V'alav, and besides for the golden table, you know, sometimes you could have a golden spoon, but nothing to eat with it, that doesn't get you far. Kol minei ma'achal, all different types of food. V'chol minei megadim, u'b'samim, and all different sweets, and not only that, samim, different things that smell good, so the environment should be good. And when they place this golden table down with all the fancy things on it and all the great food, even though he's so wealthy that he can afford to have such an expensive table brought in front of him, they still recognize from where the wealth comes from. The whole world, everything belongs to Borei Olam. And when they take the table away, Hashamayim, Shamayim, Hashem, Ve'aretz, Natan, Libnei Adam. So you may think that this guy was born into wealth. Or maybe he thought of the social network, and that's how he became rich. Or maybe something else like it. That's not the case. Amartilo, the Gemara says. I told him, I asked him. 
Bimi, my child, Bimazachita Lakach, how did you merit to get such wealth? How did you become so rich? What's the key to success? So he answered him, Amali, he answered me, Katsavaiti, I was a butcher. And I didn't, you know, a living, but barely. Umikol behema shehaita nae. Whenever I had a cow that this was, I saw was special meat, something very good about it. Amarti, I said, I'm not going to sell this to somebody else. Zu, this meat, tehele Shabbat. I'm going to keep for myself and enjoy it to honor the Shabbat. So the rabbi said, Amarti lo, I answered this person back, the wealthy man that he's sitting by, who used to be a butcher. Ashrecha shezachita. Lucky are you that you merited such wealth. You deserve it. And blessed is God, Borei Olam, that was kind enough to show you His kindness and give you this wealth in return for what you've done. The Gemara shows us clearly. He was a butcher. He didn't have an education. Definitely wasn't a Harvard graduate. He had no money. He was a laborer. And all he did was that he put Shabbat before his customers. He understood that even though for business, you know, they say a shoemaker doesn't have good shoes himself, because everything good he can make a buck on, so he sells it. He does the opposite. He says, the best food, that I'm keeping for myself. Because that's a way that I could show Borei Olam how much I love his Shabbat and respect it and honor it properly. Here's what the Gemara teaches us. So we see, in short, in summary, that in the merit of being mechabed, of honoring Shabbat, there's unlimited amount of blessing that we can bring into our lives, unlimited amount of good that we take down to the world from keeping Shabbat properly and respecting it, honoring it, and enjoying it. The Zohar Kadosh writes in Parashat Yitro, Pechet, that all the blessings, Kol HaBerachot, I'm translating in Hebrew from Aramaic, HaElyonot VeHatachtonot, all the blessings from above and from below, the upper blessings, the lower blessings, meaning all the blessings of the world, Tluyot depend on Biyom HaShevi'i, on Shabbat. Because Shabbat is Mekor, is the source of all the Berachot. If God forbid somebody's ill, and he has a bad disease, and that disease also brings him a bunch of symptoms, and we medicate him for the symptoms, but we don't medicate him for the actual disease. We don't kill the bacteria, but instead we treat him for all his little symptoms along the way. The man won't live long. Everything's going to be gone. Because symptoms are very nice, but that's not the issue. The issue is that you've got to deal with the problem from the source. The same thing is on the flip side. In a good thing, if we want to get good, and we take, we nitpick little drops of good, but we don't absorb, we don't take in the source of all the blessings, the ultimate good, the highest level of the good. So it's like we're cheating ourselves. We're giving ourselves the raw end of the deal. Instead of getting everything, we're getting a small thing. It's like imagine somebody's father at an old age passed away and left him an inheritance of company. And he says, I don't want to own the company. That I'll give to somebody else. I want to work as a security guy by the door. Because my dream as a child was to hold a gun. And now that I own the place, I can do what I want. He's a fool. Sit upstairs in the CEO's chair and count the money. Don't give it away. The same thing as us. But they allow to give small blessings, little things that we're blessed with every second of the day, which three times a day in Amidah we thank him for. But besides for that, he gives the makor of the berachot, the source of all the blessing. The source of all the blessing. The big picture, the CEO of the blessing in the world is Shabbat Kodesh. So tonight, I'm on a journey, and this journey is taking me all over. Cities, towns, suburbs, villages, neighborhoods, synagogues, all over the world. To discuss what it really means through day-to-day -day stories, through things that we witnessed with our own eyes, and others that our rabbis taught us over the years. To really understand, appreciate, and respect Shabbat properly. And in that merit, we should get all the blessings that we've just mentioned and discussed. In Bnei Brak, there was a man who at the time wasn't as old as he is today. Today, soon we'll discuss who he is. He's, I think, about 90 already. Maybe some of you even know him, because he comes to Staten Island once in a while to raise funds. Who decided he wants to make a journey to Jerusalem to visit an old friend. He takes a bus 
35, 40 years ago, there was no direct bus like there is today from Nebuchadnezzar to Jerusalem. Now they have a bus for men and a bus for women and a co-ed bus. Whatever you want, they got. Then you had to take a bus to Tel Aviv. And then from Tel Aviv, you would be able to get a bus to Jerusalem. So he takes two buses. It was a long journey. And he finally makes it to Jerusalem and he gets off. And he's not that familiar with Jerusalem. And he stops the first Orthodox Jew that he sees. And he says, Yehudi, my brother, do me a favor. And he says, what? He said, I'm looking for the house of the Chubin Rav. The Rebbe of Chubin. In Jerusalem until today, there's a yeshiva, a very prestigious Hasidic yeshiva, called Yeshiva Chubin. I want to go see the rabbi. So he says, Chubin Rav, what's the question? Every kid in Jerusalem knows where he lives. Come, it's on my way anyway, let me take you. That's what a good Jew does. So he walks into the home of the Chubin Rav. The Shabina Rav was a matmid atzum. He studied Torah nonstop, day and night. Except when he had to sleep or pray or the few bites that he ate during the day. The rest of his life was only Torah. So there was no hours, call me at this time, come at that time. People walked in and waited for him to lift his head from the Gemara and then they caught his attention and asked what they had. But the rest of the time he was in his library studying. And this man walks in and he waits and the Shabina Rav picks up his head. And he says, Rabbi, how are you? So the Shabina Rav turns to him, and in a uh, rich Hungarian Yiddish, he tells him, Ved Bistu, who are you? So he says, I'm Yankele. So he tells him, I know a lot of Yankeles, which one? And the Shabina Rav also didn't see that well at the end of his life. He says, I'm Yankele the Kurzer, which means Yankele the short one. And he's really short, this rabbi is about 4'9". He says, I don't know, I know a lot of Yankele, the short ones too. Which Yankele? I don't know who you are. He says, if you don't remember me, come, let me sing you a song. Okay, imagine somebody walked into us, started singing in the office in the middle of the afternoon. You would find the nearest exit. That's what they have exit signs in every company for. And Shavina Rav goes back to his Gemara, and in the background, this Yankele, the Kurzer, the short Yankele, starts singing. And he sings a song in a beautiful tune to the words of Kol Hashem Yachil Midbar Yachil Hashem Midbar Kadesh Words that we sing every Friday night in Kabbalah Shabbat. And as he's singing the song the Shabin Rav looks up steers at him and faints falls on the floor. The people rush into the room here a stranger came into the rabbi tells him hello the rabbi says he doesn't know him starts singing him songs and the rabbi faints. What's going on? overprotective students over there. Rabbi, they right away push the stranger back. <laughs> we got to figure out what your story is. They wake up the Tribunal Rav. And when the Tribunal Rav wakes up, he looks at this Yankale the Kurtzer and he tells him, My friend, Chaveri, I'm so happy that you came to visit me. So now the people let him get back close to the rabbi. He's not a danger. And they ask him, What's going on here? How do you know the Tribunal Rav? What's this song that you sang? Why did he faint? What's happening? And this is what he says. Let me share with you a story. He says, me and the Shabina Rav went to Siberia together 20 years ago. The Shabina Rav was a little older. He was considered the Talmud Chacham, the rabbinic authority, the Torah sage, in those terrible, terrible days. And I was one of his close followers. And the first week that we're there, it's the winter, Siberia, 40 degrees below zero, Friday afternoon, the Shabina Rav comes to me and tells me, Yainkale, it's going to be Friday night soon. We have to do Kabbalah Shabbat. We need a minyan. See if you can put together a minyan. And he turns to the Shabina Rav over there in those days and he says, Rebbe, maybe you're not realizing, but number one, it's dangerous. If God forbid the soldiers see us praying, they'll kill us all on the spot. Pikuach Nefesh. You're not allowed to do this. Number two, where are we going to pray? If we want to hide, we have to hide outside in the forest. If we hide outside in the forest, at night it's 60 below zero. It's dangerous. You can't stay outside. You could freeze to death. And number three, do you really think after a whole week of slave work under these conditions with minimal food, there's going to be even one Jew that's going to be interested in joining a minyan? There's no chance. And then Shabina Rav tells them, get a minyan. We need a minyan. And here he goes, and Munat Chachamin, the rabbi asks, let's do, and he looks for a minyan. 
And Yisrael Kiddoshimem, Jews are holy. And you go to them and ask them to join, they join. And one after another, one guy says yes, and the next guy says yes, and the next guy, and they have ten people. And they make up before sunset, they're going to gather in the forest, hidden between the trees, and they're going to pray Kabbalah Shabbat, and the Chazan, the Kente, is going to be none other than the Shabina Rav himself. And that's what they do. The Ashkenaz Jewry begins their prayers with L'chun Iranina, that's their Kabbalah Shabbat starts. And over there they're saying L'chun Iranina, the Shabina Rav singing the words of the Tehillim, piece by piece. And as they're inching closer to Mizmor David, one of the people drops on the floor. The cold won him over. He's weak, he's frail, he's starving, and it's freezing outside. At this point, obviously, it's really Pikuach Nefesh. Those around pick him up, and they run with him to the barracks, where at least it was a little warmer, to hope that they can save his life. Avgalinsky is amongst them. This Yankel is a short one. And he goes into the barracks and he sees that the person is stabilizing and he's okay. And he looks around and he doesn't see the Shabina Rav. So he wanted to know what happened to the Rebbe. So he goes back out to the forest. And over there he sees the Shabina Rav standing in the same exact position that he was standing before. Except now he was holding a little further in the prayer. And with the tune that he then composed in Siberia in the forest, he sang the words, Kol Hashem Yachil Midbar, the voice of Borei Olam, is going to fill up, is going to sing in the Midbar, they were in the middle of nowhere. And he watched him, and he said, the cold may have froze a Jew. The soldiers may want to kill, a Jew, kill all the Jews. But by the Shabina of Shabbat, Kabbalat Shabbat is going to stay alive forever. And he says, and that's the tune that I sang back to the Shabina of. The tune that over there he sang and he composed under those terrible circumstances. That was the power of a Talmud Chacham. That no matter what, no matter how life took him, no matter what situation he was in, he was still able to sing, Kol Hashem Yachil Mitzvah. That short Yankale, his name is Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky. The last one of the generation of the Magidim that are alive today. May God give him a a long life. He said this story over many times in many places. I merited to hear it from him. And then he added on one more thing. He said the simple understanding in the Pasuk is, what does Kol Hashem Yachil Midbar mean? That the Midbar is scared of the voice of God. He said, no, he has a different explanation. There's another way to translate the word Yachil, waiting, yearning, yearning for a great thing. He said the Midbar, the empty place, that cold night in Siberia, the forest was yearning, it was waiting for Kol Hashem, for the Shabina Rav to get up there and sing the praises of God under those terrible circumstances. Today we're gifted. We don't have to freeze. We got heat in our synagogues in the winter and air conditioning in the summer. And if God forbid it's not cold or warm enough, the Gabai knows about it from the whole community instantly. And the next week it's double as cold or hot just to compensate. We, have, we don't have these challenges. Friday afternoon we can drive, park right outside the synagogue. We don't even have to walk to get there if we're on time. We have to pierce the walls of the synagogue with our call Hashem a million times over from what the Shabina Rav did. If under those circumstances this is what they did, then imagine what we have to do. But sometimes, without paying attention, God forbid nobody means bad. It's not like that. Now, we're entering, this is the perfect time to talk about this, our first short Friday of the winter season. We changed the clock. This week, Shabbat, at Lakat Nerot is going to be, I think, like 420-something. It's going to be nice and early. And we're in America. And in America we're slaves to our jobs, to our businesses, to our careers. This is the real Mitzrayim. It's worse than Egypt. In Egypt they enslaved us. Here we enslave ourselves. On that yachil, on the yearning for another buck. And it's a big nisayon to get up at Chatzot Ayom and say, I'm closing the business. I don't care about anything and I'm going home. 
Because I need time to get ready for Shabbat properly. To come into the synagogue calm, not half-dressed, half-not, confused. What just hit me? It was a tornado at home and I ran away. It's a big misayon, it's a big test. But if we understand Shibishara Ratzot, the wealth of the other countries, where does it come from? Kvodah Shabbat, honoring Shabbat, then we understand that by staying at work another couple of hours, we're definitely not going to get richer, if anything vice versa. And by being brave and strong and saying, I'm not scared to close early, and I'm not scared to do what I have to do, because I'm going to be one of those who's going to be Mechabed Shabbat, who's going to honor Shabbat properly, definitely will be blessed with wealth. There's an extremely wealthy family in the United States named the Parnas family. All their siblings on all sides and ends are wealthy. I say this story countless times wherever I go. It's one of my favorite stories I ever heard in my life. And recently, in the past few weeks, I heard another piece to the story that I didn't know until now. And I've been retelling the story to add on the piece that I was missing. Listen to this. This gentleman comes from somewhere in Lithuania, I think, to the United States of America, the beginning of the 20s. Back then, to be a Shomer Shabbat in the U.S. was impossible, or practically impossible. Because if you wanted to get a job, it wasn't like today that we work four days, five days a week, six days some people have to work. It was a seven-day work week no matter what. There were no questions asked. And if we think that 9.6% of unemployment is enough to throw out Obama from his uh, safe haven, then uh, back then uh, unemployment was in the high 40s of percent. There was no jobs. So if you already got a job, you wanted to hold on to it. And somebody who wanted to be an Orthodox Jew went through the same thing every single week. You came to work Sunday, Friday afternoon you got paid, you didn't show up the next day because it was Shabbat, Sunday you came back to work and found that you were already fired without them notifying you and they replaced you with somebody else because you didn't show up to work on Saturday. And this Jew comes to the U.S. fantasizing that this is the land of gold, like many people came to the U.S. dreaming until this very day. We still fall into that same trap. And very quickly got that rude awakening that that land of gold is not gold to everybody. Some people it's white gold, some people it's yellow gold, and other people it's black gold. Hard work gold. And he gets his first job on Friday afternoon, he's fired. And his second job on Friday afternoon, he's fired. And his third job and Friday afternoon he's fired and the fourth week the word went out that he's at Shomer Shabbat so he has nobody to go to to get a job anymore they turn him down before he walks in in the 20's because they didn't trust people with money because people were so tight on money you didn't pay rent once a month like we do today you paid rent every week his rent on his apartment was five dollars a week which back then was a substantial amount of money and after two weeks of not having a job, he didn't have $5 to pay rent for the next week. And the landlord tells him he's giving him a grace period of seven days, and if by the following week he doesn't get $10, one for this week and one for next week, he's out. Now we got to go to court, and after going to court, who knows, if you're lucky, and you have, uh, God is on your side, and you do a lot of ishtalut, then maybe you'll get your tenants out that didn't pay you. Back then, it wasn't like that. It was the Italian era downtown Brooklyn and Manhattan, they moved you out, they helped you move. Sometimes in a nice way, sometimes in other ways, but it was a free moving service. They didn't need a truck, it went straight out the window. And he knew the guy meant business. And the guy comes to him the next week and he says, ten dollars, and he says, I don't have. And he says, you want to get out nicely or do you want me to help you get out? And he gets out. It's February. It's Fifteen degrees outside. And this man with four children and his wife are thrown onto the street with nowhere to go. No homeless shelters, no hostels, nothing. Everybody's in the same boat. Nobody can even afford to help. And a goy, who was the maintenance guy over there in the building, sees four children freezing outside. And after an hour, this guy was from Hasideh Umot Ulam and walks up to Mr. Parnas and tells him, sir, why are you out on the street? And he says, I have no money, I was thrown out. He says, well, what are you going to do? He says, I don't know. He says, what do you mean you don't know? You need to plan very quickly. Look at your kids, they're trembling. He said, I know, but what should I do? He says, why can't you get a job? He says, because I won't work on Saturday. He says, I don't know. Saturday, not Saturday, that's not my territory. 
but to leave you out here on the street, I have a heart. Listen to what we could do. One of my jobs in this building is to fuel the boiler with coals. It wasn't gas like today. I had to put coals in every morning. And being that it's February already and most of the winter's out, the coal room is two-thirds empty. If you want, you can move your family into the coal room. And you'll have heat. At least you won't freeze. And over there, he moves his kids into the coal room. And he goes with his children to live under those circumstances. He tries here and there to hustle some work just to make money for food, and like that the weeks are going by. One day his kids are playing outside, and if anybody ever handled coal, forget about been in a coal room, you know that very quickly his skin turns black, the color of the coal. And here are kids that are European kids that were raised on speaking Yiddish, that look like African American males. And they're playing outside, and an old Jewish wealthy woman walks by, and she sees what she thinks are Schweitzers talking Yiddish. And that was a novelty back then. And she goes up to them and she says, how do you guys know Yiddish? They say, what do you mean? We're Jewish. She says, from where? So they say, from wherever they are. Lithuania, Poland, I'm not even sure where. I guess Poland, they spoke Yiddish. I said, so why are you dark? So he says, it's from the coals. What coals? He said, we'll show you where we live. Said, you live with coals? Yeah, but that's dangerous. Fumes, toxics. We have nowhere else to live. It's better than freezing. And this woman walks behind them because she doesn't believe what she's seeing. And she goes into the coal room and they show her their, li <coughs> their living quarters. So she turns to the father and she says, why don't you get a job? He says, I can't. He says, why can't you? He says, because I'm a Shomer Shabbat and nobody wants to hire me. A Jew is a Jew. And even though she was very, very far from religion, she went home that night, and her husband says, let's go out for dinner, and she says, I'm not going out. Why not? I'm on a hunger strike. And what are you striking about? He says, we're going to go to some fancy restaurant and spend all this money, when I just saw kids that live in a coal room? No way! He says, what are you talking about? She tells him the whole story. She says, okay, so what's the big deal? We'll go to dinner, on the way we'll stop there, we'll give the guy some money, I can afford it, we'll help him out. Calm down, if that's what's going to make you happy, you got it. And that's what they do. They get into their car, they go, they stop over there by this coal room, they walk into Mr. Parnas, and the guy takes out $100, which then was a home rob, fortune of money. And he says, here you go, go get yourself an apartment. Mr. Parnas should have started dancing and singing, right? God sent them a miracle. He doesn't do that. He turns to the guy and he says, is your business open on Shabbat? And he says, yes. He says, then I'm sorry, I can't accept the money. He says, what do you mean you can't accept the money? Why? He says, because if this money was earned against God's will on Shabbat, how am I going to have pleasure from it? I can't have pleasure from something that was earned against God's will. Some people say, ah, that's crazy. It's hard to understand. So I want to ask you a question. I don't know if there are any smokers in the room. You don't have to say yes. But in case you smoke, imagine you need a light. You're desperate for a cigarette. It's been an hour, and the lighter in the car exactly that day doesn't work, and your cigarette lighter doesn't work, and it's windy outside. You already went through all your matches, and none of them with the cigarette. And now you're frustrated and agitated, and the addiction's burning inside of you, and you need that light. And suddenly you see that there's smoke coming from somewhere right behind. And you turn around, God forbid not this place, not any Jewish place, but you see a synagogue that has smoke coming out of it. You figure there's no smoke without a fire, right? I can get a light. And you go inside and you see the Sefer Torah burning. Would you bend down over the Sefer Torah and grab a light for your cigarette? No, right? How about a non-religious Jew? Somebody who doesn't even fast on Kippur. Would he bend down over a Sefer Torah and light a cigarette? No way. How about if you were at gunpoint? Would you do it then? Not either. No matter how close or how far you are, no Jew in the world would bend down to a burning Sefer Torah and light a cigarette. Well, in that Sefer Torah, it says to keep Shabbat. And not keeping Shabbat is burning that part of the Sefer Torah for the sake of business. And that's why Mr. Parnas wasn't able to take that money. I know it hurts, it's hard to hear, but what should we do? It's the truth. The guy goes to his wife and says, you sent me to a crazy Jew. I offer him a hundred bucks, his kids are freezing, and he doesn't take the money. He sent me to a nut. 
And she says, nut, 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 my hunger strike is continuing. <laughs> At that point, he says, okay, she wants to strike, good for her, he sends her home. And he goes out to eat. But the next morning, she's in bed. Honey, get out of bed. I can't. Why? I'm weak. Why are you weak? Because I didn't eat. So eat something. I'm not going to eat. Those kids are living in a cold room. I'm not eating. But I went to them. They don't want to take the money. Go again. Maybe today. Come with me. I'm too weak. I'm staying in bed. And he goes himself to the house. And he meets Mr. Parnas. And he figured he'll, make, he'll raise the ante. It'll make it more tempting. This time $200. 40 weeks of where to live. Hands him $200. He says, please. You know what? Don't do it for you. Do it for me. For the sake of my wife that she should eat breakfast today. Take the $200. <laughs> he says, I'm sorry. I can't take the money. Goes back home. He says, I offered him 200 He didn't take it either. So she says, Okay. Let the strike continue. And by the time dinner time comes, and he realizes that very shortly his wife's going to a hospital, he goes back to the Instaponis, but this time he doesn't offer him money. He walks in, and he says, tell me something. Are you crazy? Your kids are starving. You're living in a cold room. Are you crazy? Here's money. Take it. And Mr. Parnas tells him, maybe you just don't understand what Shabbat is. And out of frustration, he looks at him and he says, Okay, so teach me. And he says, Sit down. He says, We're in the coals, no way. He says, Come on, sit down, feel what it's like. And he sits him down. And over there, he sits with him for a few hours that night and he explains what it means, Shabbat. Matana tova bevet kinazai. But Elam says, I have a wonderful, precious gift that was hidden in my most hidden chambers, in the biggest vault. In the safest safe. And I want to give it to the Jews. And what's that gift? Shabbat Kodesh. He says, and that was the gift that God went and saved for us from the day He created the world. And that was the purpose of creation. And that was the purpose of putting me and you into the world too. How would we go and throw away that gift? That's why I'm so stubborn. And he goes on and on and on to explain him the simple importance of Shabbat that nobody ever bothered to teach us. And over there, at the end of the conversation, Israel Kidoshimim, Jews are pure. When they hear the truth, they change. He looks at Mr. Parnas and he tells him, tell me something. He says, what? He says, if I promise to keep Shabbat from this week on, will you take the money? And Mr. Parnas says, no. And he says, why not? Now I'm a Shomer Shabbat. He says, it's true, but this money still comes from the money you made last week. That was money that was earned on Shabbat. So he says, so then what? He says, wait one more week. And after you really close everything, the new money that you'll make next week, from there I'll take assistance. And at the end of the next week, finally he came to him. And at that point he gave him a lot of money. He actually settled him in a house and gave him a job. They moved out of the cold room, like Yehudim Aitahura, they could see sunlight again, and they began a new life. Now listen to this. It was a matter of a very, very short period of time, and Mr. Parnas was calling the right shots in the business, and this gentleman went and took him in as a partner. From there, gave him money and helped him out, because they were partners in life too. He was the one who showed, Mr. Parnas taught him Torah, and he taught him business, and helped him start his own business. And this man, in the days of the Great Depression, when everybody was losing all their money, became a millionaire. And until this very day, four generations later, all his kids and grandchildren, each and every one on their own merit, wherever they live in the U.S. and Israel, are all extremely wealthy individuals, and none of them were hurt by the recent financial crisis. Four generations this is going on. One of his grandchildren lives two blocks away from me. Now here's the end of the story that's new to me. I said over this story in a class. So there was one skeptic that didn't believe me. So he went online and listed all the partners and started lifting up the phone and calling them until he found the, those that belonged to this family. And they affirmed that the story is true the way I said it over. And then they told him, let me add on one more piece to the story. He says, what's that? He said it was in Tafshin Nundalid, not that long ago. 
that we sat by a wedding of our grandfather Parnas' grandson with this wealthy individual who helped him out back then, his great-granddaughter. And we not only were partners in life and in business, we now joined in marriage too. So Shabbat ended up bringing out a shiduch along the way as a bonus. Shabbat Hamalka, so it fits well. The queen and the kala is like a queen. It all fits into one puzzle. That was the Mesirut Nefesh that just a few years ago, here in America, Jews were willing to have a Shabbat. And that's the Mesirut Nefesh that we have to have at a much lower level because nobody's firing us for not working on Saturday. To be brave and stand up and say, Money's not going to bribe me. The Satan is not going to come in the shape of a Benjamin Franklin. Business is getting shut. Somebody who, God forbid, has a business, there's no choice, like a hospital or whatever, that has to stay open on Shabbat, you'll go to your rabbi, and there's such a thing as partnering up with a Gentile, and, and that would be the way, the only way, that it might be permissible to keep open a business on Shabbat. But other than that, we don't benefit from it. I said over this story, the first, minus the end that I didn't know until recently, Eight years ago, in a seminar, and over there was sitting an Israeli boy, called himself Sammy, and at the end of the class he raises his hand, he was the first one who said he wants to ask a question. I said, okay, what's your question? He says, I live in Israel six or seven months a year, and I come to the U.S. for the other months. Why? Because my money comes from here, this is my, here's my business. I said, what's your business? He says, I have beach stores on the beachfront in Wildwood, New Jersey. He says, half the stores are mine. We sell t-shirts and bathing suits and accessories and all these things, and they're my stores. And he says, and during the week, there's nobody there. He says, when is the beach busy? When's it happening? When is the majority of sales? From Friday afternoon until Saturday night. That's the busiest time. He says, so 80% of my money comes in on that day. You mean to tell me that I should shut down my business? Are you nuts? I said, wait a second. I'm telling you that there's two choices. Either you believe that the Torah is true or not. If it's not, so this conversation makes no difference anyway to you. So let's forget about it. And if you believe in God and that He gave the Torah and the Torah is true, in that Torah it says that Shabbat is the source of blessing. So I am 100% sure that you won't get hurt by keeping Shabbat. He says, wait, you mean to tell me that if I shut my business on Shabbat, the next week, I'm going to see in the bank the same amount of money that I used to make. And I looked at him and with a half a smile, half a smirk, I told him, even more. Yeah. And he says, and if not, I said, so if not, you were tested by a tough test, number one. And number two, you'll be able to say that I lied to you. That might look good on one of your <laughs> blogs or whatever. He says, you know what? And he stands up brave and he says, I swear in the name of everything that I believe in, that this week all my stores are going to be closed. And this gentleman, who about a guy like that, we could say, Gibore Koach Oseret Sono, the strong people with strong will that do Bore Olam's commandment, that Friday afternoon, two hours before sunset, closed all his stores. He heard back Saturday night when he reopened, that that week on the beach, nobody was in the water, everybody was talking, what's going on here? Peak season, busy weekend, it happened to have been a holiday weekend, all the stores are shut. Every other booth closed. Why? Sammy went nuts. He decided to keep show up. <laughs> oh, hey, let his Goyim workers do the work. No, it's his business. He's closing everything. Thursday, I get a call. And I could see by the caller ID, because I stored his name in my cell phone, that it was Sammy. I picked up with mixed feelings, but my faith was stronger, so I was pretty calm when I picked up the phone. I said, Sammy, what's up? And he says, Ataloma Amin. You won't believe it. I said, what happened? He says, we just did the accounting. We go Thursday to Thursday. And we made $88,000 more gross than we did any other week this season being closed on Shabbat. I said, so next week we're closing again? He says, tell me, should I close earlier? <laughs> and as I was there, until this very day, eight years later, there's still stores in Wildwood, New Jersey, they get closed every single Shabbat from two hours before sunset until an hour and a half after sunset shut down, closed. Except that now he doesn't have a mystery anymore. He put on his doors of his stores when they're closed down 
an explanation of why they're closed. So in case there's a Jew that doesn't understand it, Shabbat afternoon, he should get the opportunity to learn why a store should be shut down on Shabbat. Today he's married with children, lives in Israel, studies most of the year because he doesn't have to work, thank God the businesses are running on its own, and supports an entire kolel from the blessing of Shabbat. Because when God writes something in the Gemara, he wasn't joking around, it wasn't a sense of humor, he meant <coughs> business. It pains me at times when I'm invited to places for Shabbat, and I have such wonderful hosts who are so sweet, and they take care of me, and they give me a nice room, and everything, wonderful achnasat ochim. We go to the synagogue Friday night, at least the men do, and we come back, and when we open the door, we feel like we're walking into a cemetery. All the women are wearing robes slash pajamas, sleeping on couches, normally with newspapers covering their faces, because they started reading the news and fell asleep with the paper. The table is bare, and the angels that walked in with us waiting for Shalom Aleichem, first have to hear an alarm clock, a wake-up call to wake everybody up. Hello, get up, it's Shabbat, get dressed, let's get to the meal, let's start. The Ari Kadosh brings down, and I think it's hinted in the Zohar too, that if the angels come into a house together with the man when he comes home from the synagogue, the two angels that bless us Friday night, and the table is not set with the food on it, ready to go, ready to make Kiddush right away, they say, we don't have time to wait, and they leave. They don't stay, and they don't leave the blessing. How important is it? And it's a big test for women. They work hard all week. They have kids on their head and other things. And it's stressful. And the preparations for Shabbat are even more stressful sometimes. How important is it to overcome all of that? And to be strong. And say, we're going to be ready. And we're going to do it right. And not just right. On our level, we're going to have the gold table. We're going to do the best because that's Kvod HaShabbat. That's honoring Shabbat. My uncle, Zechat Tzadik Livachah, once told us that he was invited on a Friday morning to go visit a student of his. And he thought that the reason why he was invited there was because the woman just had a baby three weeks before, so most probably she wanted a blessing for the baby or for herself. So he gladly agreed to go. He said, Friday morning, 10 o'clock, I'm going to go to the house. And he shows up, it's Friday morning, 10 o'clock, and this is in the summer, not in the winter. And the woman tells him, Rabbi, maybe you want to eat something? So he says, no, it's fine. He says, no, it's a mitzvah. He says, what mitzvah is there to eat Friday morning, 10 o'clock? Jews, we always have mitzvot that are food somehow or the other. So she tells him, to taste the food of Shabbat on Friday, it's a blessing for long life. Rabbi, come, taste the dishes. He says, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, what this is? She said, I woke up at 5, everything's ready. He says, what? I want to see. He says, he walked into the kitchen, and he had tears in his eyes, he was filled with emotion. Here's a woman, three weeks after a baby, 10 o'clock in the morning, in the summer, when she has the whole day, everything's ready. And he said, not one, one and a half dishes, a feast, everything's ready. And he said, food like this he has to taste. I sat there for an hour, and dish by dish, I tasted food out of every pot, because I felt I was eating a live Kiddush Hashem. I was eating God's glory. And this is the power, this is the commitment that Jewish people have, that Jewish women have, to the honor and the respect of Shabbat. There was a rabbi in Israel, passed away ooh, about 20 years ago, a little over, the stipler. Rabbi Shal Yaakov Kanievsky. His son is Rav Chaim Kanievsky, the famous rabbi today in Bnei Brak that everybody runs to for blessings. That's his son. He was also in Siberia, together with many other rabbis that were there. And he was a watch guard, and he would do a night shift. And they didn't give him the proper gear, because they were ch cheap on money. So what they did was, there was an, enough coats and armor and everything else for one soldier per unit, per shift. And when you came to switch the previous guy, he would give you his coat and whatever else. And like this, you would have to stay warm in the freezing nights. And one Friday night, he comes to do his shift. Koach Nefesh, you're allowed to. And he goes outside. And the guy who was before him on post left two minutes early. 
but he wasn't a bad guy. He knew he needed the coat. So he left him the coat hanging on a tree. Now to take a coat off of a tree that's growing is a safek of an isud de rabanan. It's not a deoraita. It's not like lighting a fire, God forbid, or turning on a car. It's an isud de rabanan. It's a much lesser sin. It's freezing cold. You're allowed to do it. Safek pikuach nefesh. It's a mitzvah to do it in that situation. But the stifler couldn't see himself. He couldn't bring himself to desecrate the Holy Shabbat. Even though in his case it was permissible. And the entire night, he survived without a coat. And when he came in the next morning and everybody realized what happened, they asked him, how is it physically possible? Forget about that it's extreme. How is it physically possible? How didn't you freeze? And he said, this is what I did. And from this we can learn a trick for life. So when I got there and I realized what's going on, I didn't say, I'm not going to wear the coat. Because then I would have gave up right away. It was freezing. I said, two minutes I could hold out. Yeah. So for two minutes I'm not taking the coat. In two minutes from now I will. But two minutes I'm not taking the coat. Two more minutes I could hold out. Yeah. And two minutes. And another two minutes. And another two minutes. And another two minutes. And before I knew it, the night was over. Many of us are tested with different sins on Shabbat. And it's hard. Somebody's an addicted smoker. It's very hard. It's a challenge. Many other things are challenges. Habits are the biggest challenge sometimes. We're addicted to our way of life. Sometimes if we get up and say, I'm never doing this again on Shabbat, that's nice in theory. But in reality, it doesn't work out because the first time you break it, you give up. So that's the solution. The first hour of Shabbat, that you could keep properly. So at least do it that way. Friday night dinner, you could do the nicest way. Shabbat day, you're tired already, you're annoyed, whatever, okay, it's too hard for you. But Friday night, you could do the best way. Do it the best way. And two minutes, and another two minutes, and another two minutes, and sooner or later we become those who perfect the strategy of kabod and oneg Shabbat. Of honoring and respecting the Shabbat properly the way we really should. There's a famous story, but it actually happened with one of my uncle's students of a young girl who her parents sent her to a religious gan, a religious play school, a preschool for kids, even though they themselves weren't religious. But it was closer to the house, and they felt there might have been a better education too, so they sent her there. And she was there, and the first week, they taught her that every Jewish woman should light candles Friday before sunset. And she said, wait a second, my mother doesn't light candles. <laughs> So she comes back to her mother Friday afternoon and she says, Mommy, we have to light candles. So she says, what candles? For what? She says, Friday, Shabbat, we have to light candles. He says, no, we don't do those things. Why not? Light candles. We don't do those things. And this six-year-old girl decided that if her mother doesn't want to light, she's going to light instead. So she starts preparing, looking for where the candles. So the mother said, en nerot babayit. There's no candles in the house. She didn't want to let her kid light candles. So the kid heard that, she doesn't give up. Children are pure, they don't play the games that we play sometimes. She goes down to the makolet, to the store right downstairs, and he, she tells the mocher, the sales guy, give me two candles. Now if you go into any grocery store and ask for two candles, they don't sell two tea lights. So what candles do they sell individually? Nerot neshama. Two yard side candles. So this guy figured two candles, two yard side candles. He gives her two yard side candles. She goes home, she hides the candles in her room, she waits until when she thinks is the right time, and behind closed doors she takes a match and she lights both candles. Her mother, after half an hour, doesn't see the daughter anywhere. She says, what's going on? She comes to her room, she opens up the room, she sees two nerot and shama and her daughter sitting in front of them. She flips out and she says, Maze, what's this? So he said, Hidlakti nerot, I lit candles, Yud bishvil ma, for what? He said, Hidlakti echad le'aba ve'echad le'ima. I live one for my mother and one for my father. <laughs> that lady today is religious. For obvious reasons. She got a live Musad class from her six-year-old daughter. <laughs> but at the same time, lighting candles is a very serious thing. We light candles. What does that mean? That we're acknowledging that Shabbat is business. It's not a joke. You can't light candles and five minutes later light the tel television. That's a contradiction. And that's like a split personality, borderline personality disorder. It's diagnosed in medicine today. The treatment for it is to learn halakha and musa. 
It doesn't, it doesn't add up. You can't sit Friday night and make Kiddush, say, we're going to keep Shabbat, and 10 minutes later, light up a cigarette. You live in a contradiction. Make up your mind. If it's Shabbat, so there's no cigarette. And if not, so who are you lying to? We definitely don't want to lie to God every Friday night again. That definitely doesn't make any sense. Interesting. And Shabbat has such a great power that it's worth all the investment that it takes. Now let's go a step further. Chafetz Chaim asks, why is it that Shabbat is the most serious thing, the strongest mitzvah that the Gemara talks about in very harsh ways that late at night we won't discuss, and how important it is to the good and the bad to keep properly? Why Shabbat at all the mitzvot? Why do we pick that? And here's what the Chafetz writes. The Chafetz Chaim writes. He says, let's say you want to go buy new shoes. So you drive to whatever store you like, you come over there, you're on Fifth Avenue, you come, you look at the address, the GPS brings you, you have arrived at your destination, you park the car, and you go, you come to the door, it's locked. Lights are closed. What does that mean? You must probably came after seven, eight, nine, whatever store you went to. All right. The next day you'll go on time, it'll be open, you'll go in, you'll buy what you want. But what happens if you come to the store a few days in a row and it's closed? It still doesn't mean anything. You keep on coming late. Come on time. It'll be open. But what happens if you show up to a store and the sign that used to say, whatever, Salvatore Ferragamo doesn't exist there anymore and there's nothing in the window and everything's empty? So then you know that the store went out of business. Chafetz Chaim says that's the mashal. And the nimshal is very simple. There's 613 mitzvot. 50-something of them that are applicable today, five every day. Many people, the Yetzirah gets the best of them, and by mistake, they forget to keep the mitzvot. All right, so they're like after hours. Now their store, their Jewish store was closed. Shabbat is the sign on the outside of the store. When somebody says, I don't care, and I don't keep Shabbat, at that point, he's removing the sign outside, and he's saying the store is out of business. We close shop. That's why the Torah gave such importance and emphasized in so many different ways the severity and on the other hand on the positive aspect the great blessing and the importance of keeping Shabbat and tonight we added on the key word not only keeping it but properly with a whole heart now let's imagine a scenario inshallah soon the Bet HaMikdash is going to be come down in fire in Jerusalem and that mosque is going to blow away and we're going to have the Bet HaMikdash and we're going to come visit, right? We'll hopefully be frequent visitors in the Bet Mikdash. And now let's imagine that we walk into the Bet Mikdash together with some goyim, our friends. A goy could also come to the Bet Mikdash. A goy, if a goy brings korbanot, we even accept it from him, Mishum Shalom, for peace reasons, if it's a kosher korban. What does a Gentile see in the Bet Mikdash? And what does a Jew see in the Bet Mikdash? Our Pincus makes an unbelievable observation. What they do in the Bet Mikdash in the entrance area in Azara, they slaughtered animals. They had a Mizbeach HaChitzon, over there they brought Kobanot, they slaughtered animals. And there was a lot of blood all day, and a lot of slaughtering going on. So the Gentile that comes to the Bet Mikdash, to him what does it look like? A slaughterhouse. He would go on to PETA.org or whatever those foolish people are, to tell him to come fight for animal rights. Like that clown that went to Israel to do the same thing now. She doesn't understand how the rabbis approve Shechita. All right. What does a Jew see in the Bet Mikdash? Bet Mikdash, Kedusha. Holiness, the Bet Mikdash, this is what we're waiting for for 2,000 years. We're praying for it. But they're both seeing the same thing. What's the answer? One person is a Jew. And a Jew's vision is to see Kedusha. And the other person wasn't gifted with that vision. He just doesn't see Kedusha. He sees the facts. And the facts are a slaughterhouse. Some people say, Shabbat's so long, it's so hard, it's so boring. You know what the answer is? If we behave properly, if we condition ourselves to be God's kids and proud to be God's kids, so then our vision, we hear the word Shabbat, we go into Shabbat, what do we see? Kedusha, the greatest pleasure. But if... Other things poisoned us to the point that we don't have that vision anymore. 
then we have to go for urgent LASIK, to spiritual LASIK, to correct the vision. Because then what we're going to see in Shabbat is, oof, it's so long, I can't deal with it. I want to sleep through the whole thing. Somebody sent me a halakha question recently. Rabbi, I don't like Shabbat. This is what he writes me straight out. Is it permissible, according to the halakha, that I take strong sleeping pills and sleep 26 hours straight? <laughs> That's what he wants to know. I feel bad for him. I, re- I really feel bad. For somebody who otherwise is going to turn on a TV and smoke, yeah, that's, that's the perfect solution. That's a lot better. At least you're not desecrating Shabbat. But he doesn't see Shabbat. He doesn't see Kedusha. What does he see? Nothing. Poor guy. So I wrote back to him, Shabbat himi li zogu rufuah krova lavo. Olam should send you a rufuah for your vision. You should see in Shabbat that it screams holiness. Not a pain in the neck. Not a reason to knock yourself out. At the level that we have to aspire to get to. The truth is, when we talk about Shabbat, we can go on for hours. And that's not what we're going to do tonight. Maybe next time I'm here, we'll continue. I just want to end off with one more story. There is a guy in Israel, a very, very famous tour guide, a religious tour guide, who he advertises a lot here and everything to get customers. His job is Kishmo Kenhu, like his name is exactly what he is. A tour guide picks you up from the airport, he has a nice car, he drives you around wherever you want to go, takes care of you, gets you a hotel, it is, all your arrangements when you're in Israel, so you should have a pleasant trip. <coughs> That's his panasa. And in a way he's lucky, because for every Dalit Amot that you go in Israel, it's a mitzvah on its own, and you get Gan Eden for it, and he's constantly driving and traveling all over Israel. Lucky is he. And he also opened so many people's eyes to the beauty of Israel, that's a merit on its own, the love of Israel. When you're a tour guide, I never tried it, but I can imagine, just from my own travels, you end up meeting a whole lot of interesting people. And it's not like a plane that you sit near somebody for an hour, three hours, twelve hours in the worst case scenario. You're with them for a week, so you hear their whole life, and certain people like talking a lot, so you hear more than just their life. But, okay, it's a way of networking, why not? And one day, he gets a phone call. Phone calls from a guy, has like a broken English, and he tells him, I'm an American Jew, an elderly person, I'm coming to Israel for the first time in many, many years, I don't know my way around, there are a bunch of places I want to go to, here's roughly what I want to do, can you be my tour guide, can you take me around? And he says, sure, where do you want to go? So he tells him exactly what a good Jew says. I want to go to Kotel Amaravi, to Marat Amachpela, to Kever Achel, to the graves of Tzadikim up north, and to here, and to there, and all the holy sites of Israel, he rattles them all off there. And he says, where do you want to be for Shabbat? I've got to make you hotel arrangements or whatever. He says, I want to be in Miron, by Abshun by Yochai. Where do you want to be for Shabbat? Okay. He says, no problem. He says, do you have a comfortable car? He says, yeah, for sure, I have a great car, everything's fine. How much is it? They make up a price. And he says, I'll see you in the airport, here's the flight number, the date, the time. I'll be holding a sign, you come meet me, I'll take you around. Monday afternoon, this tour guide, his name is Nachman, is holding a uh, sign up in Ben Gurion Airport, and an old elderly gentleman comes out, sees the sign, waves, you're the guy, yeah, he sticks him into the car, and they start their travels. And he takes him to every single place that he mentioned, plus more, and explains him everything that changed, and the history, and the importance, and unbelievable! Sometimes you could be in Israel and not even realize where you are. You need somebody who knows the, the meaning and the understanding behind everything to open your eyes to every little detail in Israel. To every little detail of the Kedusha, every step along the way. Every year God gives me the merit. More than one time I take groups together with me and my students to Israel and to Europe, to Mekomot HaKadoshim. And when they come back, many of them are Israeli. They lived there many more years than I did. And they tell me, Rabbi, this was the first time in my life that I really understood Israel. They understood it from a spiritual perspective instead of a political perspective. They have a deal. And this is what this guy does for him. Takes him around and shows him everything. Shabbat, they get to Miron. And Miron, for those of you who ever tried to spend Shabbat there, there's no nice hotel. There's no Dan Hotel in uh, Miron, or the Citadel for that matter doesn't exist either. Today there's still some nicer houses that were built recently that you could rent a room in or whatever. But just a few years ago, it was practically like going to the barn. It's a moshav, it smelled like that, and there were old wooden homes or whatever, and that was it. 
And this is what he rents him, the luxury version of one of these little butkas. And this is what we're staying for Shabbat. And what about food? Trust the Yerushalmi Jew. They bring you all the food in the world. And especially this guy. And why do I say especially this guy? We pause and we'll tell you a little bit about this tour guide's life. He's not a youngster himself. He's been doing this for years. But no matter where he is, no matter who his clients are, he has a condition that's in each and every agreement with any client that he takes around Israel. That Thursday night, at midnight, he has to be in Jerusalem for 15 minutes. This is his condition. And sometimes that's a problem, because the, one, the guy wants to be up north. What Jerusalem? You know? This is what he insists on no matter what. Why? Because he has his mitzvah. His mitzvah is Oneg Shabbat. And his understanding of Oneg Shabbat is a little bakery near Harnof in Jerusalem, between Harnof and Givat Shaul, who sells chalot, and the first batch of fresh chalot for Shabbat is at 12 o'clock at night, Thursday night. And he insists that no matter what, he has to be the first person to get from the first batch in honor of Shabbat, at midnight, Thursday night, in the same bakery, every single week, no matter what. This is his thing. To each his own. And one Thursday night, he goes in as usual, and when a customer is coming to the same store for so many years, he's like family already. So he goes into the back, and he tells the guy who's in charge of this hello, and the other guy, and the mashgiach, and this one, and the sales guy. Tells everybody hello. And over there is standing a guy, one of the guys who's working on one of the mixers. He's not a youngster himself, who they employ more as a favor than as they need him. And when this guy is talking to him, and this Nachman is talking to this man, and he tells him, how are you, what's your story, what's going on? And they're having friendly chat. This elderly gentleman, it was hard for him to stand, he leans back against the mixer. Stuck his arm a little bit too far back, and the thing is turning in the mixer, and his arm gets stuck. He's dragged, but thank God he's light, and he gets spit out of it instead of getting hurt, thank God. He's laying there on the floor, his fingers bleeding, not too bad for such a tragedy, and his shirt is ripped. He got away cheap. He's in shock. Nachman runs over to him, calms him down, makes sure he's okay. Tells him everything's all right with you, yeah. He says, you sure? He says, you see, my shirt got a little ripped and whatever. But after everything I've been through in my life, big deal, this is small stuff for me. And Nachman knew exactly what he was talking about. Because on that sleeve that was ripped, there were numbers on his arm. And these were the numbers. Six, 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 seven, seven. And he shows him the numbers and he says, after this, everything in life is easy. Nachman wishes him Shabbat Shalom. He leaves and gets his chalot with joy on his merry way. Ten years later, Thursday night, he's back in the same bakery as he is every week. But this time, instead of just buying two big chalot, he buys four. Because he has a guest from America that he's going with to Miron. And it's part of the food that he's bringing up. And Friday night he sits with his guest and he tells him these are the most delicious chalot in the world. This is why I had to be in Jerusalem Thursday night. Taste them. They're sitting and they're eating. And his guest gets a little warm. He takes off his jacket. He's wearing short sleeves. And he sees on the guest's arm numbers. And those numbers were six, 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 seven, eight. And he says, wait a second, those numbers look so familiar. And then he remembers, no, they're not familiar. I know 777. And he starts asking his guests questions. Where are you from? He tells him. What's your life story? Oh, Hashem, I live in Brooklyn. I have a family and kids, grandchildren, money, everything's good. What's your life story? He says, my life story? I went through a very hard youth. Why? I was in the camps. Which camp? He tells him a name. You have any family? He says, my wife and my kids. No, any family that survived the war. He says, no. My parents were killed in front of my eyes. My sister was killed a year later in the camp in front of my eyes. And I had one brother. One day we were on a train being transferred from the work camp to the death camp. And on the way the train broke. And it stopped. And the prisoner said, this is their time to escape. And they all, many of them jumped off the train to run. Which they were hoping they would run to their freedom. But the Nazis, Yemach Shemam Vashem Zichram, were ready for this. And they were waiting with guns, shooting them down as they were jumping off. 
And he said, based on what I saw, nobody survived. And Nachman turns to this guy and he says, and where were you? He says, I was on that train. And where was your brother? He was on that train with me. So why didn't you and your brother jump off? He said, actually, my brother did jump off, but I didn't. He says, why? So I wasn't feeling well. I didn't have the physical strength to be able to jump. My brother was feeling stronger. So I turned to my brother and I told him, go, save your life at least. It's better than both of us dying. And my brother said, I'm never going to part from you. I'm not leaving. I said, that's wrong. Why should we both die? At least you, save your life, jump. And he jumped off. And I've never seen him or heard from him since. So I'm assuming he was one of those that was shot on the way. I somehow survived. He said, are you sure he's dead? He said, yeah, I'm sure. How do you know? He said, I hired investigators. I went to every Holocaust museum and every list of anybody who ever survived. And I asked anybody that I could possibly think of. And nobody, nobody knew where my brother is. And he tells him, tell me something. You went into the same camp with your brother at the same time? He says, yes. He says, was your brother older or younger than you? He says, he was younger. He said, how did the numbering work? And now the guy is getting upset. And he says, why are you talking about such painful things on Shabbat? It's supposed to be a happy day. He says, very soon it may be very happy for you. He says, it went in, in a row. And we stood on line. And we got, the first person got numbered. And the person behind him got numbered, the same number, just one digit higher. And he said, oh yeah. So I got one more question for you. He said, what's that question? He said, was he behind you or in front of you online? He said, he was behind me. He said, guess what? He says, I know your brother. I said, what do you mean you know my brother? He said, your brother's alive and he works in a bakery in Jerusalem where I bought halot on Thursday night. And he tells him the story of the mixer. He says, there was a guy there that I witnessed 10 years ago and that number stayed ingrained in my head. 66677. Seven. You're 78, so it's probably you. I don't believe you. I'm telling you. And Saturday night, instead of their original plans, a minute after Havdalah, they're on their way to Jerusalem. And they come to Jerusalem and this gentleman, years later, meets his brother that jumped off the train and one is the, was one of the few that succeeded to dodge the bullet of death and make it out alive. And what brought him back to his brother was a Jew, a simple Jew, a tour guide, who was insistent his whole life, his whole career, against his client's will sometimes, that every Thursday night, at midnight, he has to be in Jerusalem. Why? Because he has to buy the first batch of the fresh, best chalot to honor the Shabbat. We want to reunite. We want to meet all our brothers and sisters around the world. Every Jew that we're close, far to, the ones that we love, the ones that we got to learn to love very quickly. Bezat Hashem, inshallah, soon bimot ha-mashiach bimera, amen. And what's going to bring us together, what's going to help us get together, what's going to bring the Geulah soon, is what Chazal teaches us, Yilmalei Yisrael shamush tei Shabbatot. If Am Yisrael would only keep two Shabbatot, properly, with honor and respect, we would immediately reunite. We would get to meet all our brothers around the world. We should merit to see the Gulabi Meravi Amen Amen. Thank you for listening. Right.